Welcome to segment three of Citizens Forum. It's August the 7th, Wednesday. We're filming in the Memorial Arena. Our guest in this segment is uh, Saanich City Councilor and, and uh, CRD Director Vic Derman. And we're going to be talking about something that Vic has been working on for a long time, and it's called the Natural City. Um, I've seen uh, some of your... Um, your presentation on it. It's, I think it's great and we're just going to run through as much of it as we can. So Vic, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, well, we've talked about sewage on your show a couple of times, Jack. That's important. Uh, my real uh, target for this area is the natural city or something of, of that nature. I think it's incredibly important to the future. And it stems from, I guess, my background uh, both as an educator and as a politician. And I've had an an interest in urban planning and uh, future urban development for a long, long time. And what I found, especially as a politician, was there were bits and pieces. You'd go to a conference somewhere and somebody would have an idea on how you should do this. And you get a little piece. And you go somewhere else and you get a little piece. And, um, as con and our, often our planning is that way. You know, oh, we should be doing this and we should be doing a bit of that. And, oh, we should be doing a little of this too. And there was no comprehensive vision of how we should plan for the future. So after being through that for several years, I sort of thought, I'm going to try to put together a vision you know, of, of how we should be redeveloping our city, our region in the future. And that's where the natural city came from. So um, it, it, there's different parts to the presentation. And part one uh, starts off with global sustainability. Yeah, well, the first thing, the other thing I wanted to do was to say, you know, we really have to decide what's most important, first of all. You've got to set your priorities. You've got to make this structured almost hierarchically. What's most important that you really have to do? You okay. know, no question. Uh, because we don't even do that down the CRD. Oh, well, maybe we should, again, doing some of this. Maybe, you know, what's most important? So I sat down and thought and thought, okay, the very first thing it has to be global sustainability. You know, the old spaceship Earth concept. This is our spaceship. If you don't believe that, then why don't you try stepping outside the atmosphere for a little while and just see how well you do. Yeah. So, you know, you look and think, how are we treating this spaceship that we are incredibly dependent upon? You know, that is the only thing we have. And the answer is really not very good. No, we're treating you the know, Earth like a piece of garbage. Horrible things. And, and to the point where, uh, especially with climate change, global warming, that it has the potential to be destructive to our society in a huge way, far bigger than most people realize. And it also has the potential to cause one of the greatest mass extinctions that uh, has happened on planet Earth yeah. in the time we know of. In fact, going back to anything that we can uncover. So that's pretty important. So I, my first thing was, hey, that's a number one priority. You've got to make sure that you are operating in a way that will allow this spaceship to sustain you. Well, when I look around our city, um, I live in Victoria now, you're from Saanich, Cook Street, which used to be a fairly quiet street, I mean, there is a never-ending stream of traffic down there, every car. Yeah. So if we're talking about global sustainability and climate change, our transportation system is like the number one stupid thing we're doing. Well, in the Capital Regional District, 60% of the greenhouse gases that we produce come from transportation. 60%. But, you know, so second priority that I looked and thought was, okay, uh, local sustainability. Um, certainly environmental, and you've talked a little bit about some of there, but also social and economic, um, what some people would call the three legs of the stool. And the third one, for me, really comes from local sustainability, and that's quality of life and place. You know, what does this place have to offer the people who live here and to others? And of course, it's easy to say, well, gee, it's really important to the people who live here because it means how they enjoy themselves, you know, and so on and so forth. But I think it's more than that. I think in the way the economy is going, where a lot of the well-paid jobs our white collar jobs, high tech industry, and things of that nature. Well, you want people in the future to invest in this place with their, their wealth, their skills, their talents, um, but so does every other place in the world. <laughs> they all want it. So you really need to ask yourself the question, 
why would they come here? And I think the quality of life and place, this place is remarkable. Yeah, it is. You know, Roger Kipling used to describe it as the finest place in the world. Uh, well, we should, we should bank that and we should build on it. It's something that will attract the things we need yeah. in the future. Yeah. So those are the priorities. So in, uh, but when you get down to brass tacks, uh, you mentioned under local sustainability, you mentioned social. To me, the biggest social problem we've got is income inequality. And uh, that's Yeah, that's and, and those, big things, issue. those things are not unimportant. But you really, and this is why I've structured a natural city the way I have, you have to put them in the framework of, of you know, what's happening around the planet. Because we have the potential to create social problems beyond anything we've ever dreamed of. You know, if you have a one meter level of sea rise, it oh, could easily happen much sooner in this century than we thought. That wipes out almost half the rice growing capability of Bangladesh. You have the potential to easily get tens of millions of refugees from that one place alone. Um, if you have a world with several hundred million refugees, it's not going to be business as usual anywhere. You know, that's the stuff of wars and conflicts and disease and all sorts of things. So you're putting that issue as your number one? Yeah, absolutely. Has to be. That's Has to fair be. enough. Um, so part two of, of the natural city is the principles to build a vision starting with design with nature. What does that mean? Well, let's just talk a little bit about the principles. So you, you, you say, here's my priorities. You know, well, then the next question is, <laughs> how are you going to accomplish them? Uh, you know, you don't want the situation we've had in transportation in this region. We've had as regional priorities for over 10 years to increase walking, cycling, and transit use. Those are you know, our three priority modes. In 10 years, we haven't changed a thing virtually. The amount of people using single occupancy automobiles has stayed exactly the same. So if you have priorities, you've got to say, what do we need to do to get to them? And that's what the principles are for. And, and the first one, as you said, is design with nature. And it basically says when you build systems, they need to be compatible with the way the earth works, rather than working against it. So you know, stormwater is an easy one. Uh, in nature, it rains, it's absorbed by the forests and so forth, it's held, it's cleansed, it's released over time. What have we done? Well, let's rush it off the roads into some culvert, whoop into a creek or a river or rent out in the ocean, yep. taking all sorts of pollutants with it. Um, you know, it just doesn't work. Now, I saw when I when I saw the presentation. In the presentation, you show examples from I think even from Seattle, where they have a different approach, and it, it's kind of revolutionary. Well, a, lo a lot of places are starting. We're doing it now, uh, you know, starting to. We need to move faster. Look at the atrium down at uh, Johnson & Yates, a big office building okay. uh, built by the Joel Brothers, actually. It, uh, there are rain gardens on Johnson Street and on Yates Street, right in the middle of town, and they accept a lot of the rainwater from the roof of the building and the surrounding roads and so forth, and they hold it and cleanse it and act like a natural system. Really? Now, I, I, yeah, I just mean, take a look. <laughs> where know? is this rain garden? Uh, it's on the side of the road. And, and you, you see the sidewalk, and then there's this, it looks like trees and grasses and so, so forth. So they don't throw all the water that lands on their roof, for example, into the storm no, system? No, they, no. They, now, rain gardens, you know, if you have your 100-year storm, you, you're going to get a sudden yeah. runoff. But that's going to happen anywhere. It's going to happen naturally. Um, can we use a different material for our roads and sidewalks that will allow water in? Well, you can to a degree. Uh, you, it's, it's difficult. There is pervious concrete, for example, but it's, it's hard to use because it, the little spaces inside of it fill up with debris and it's not pervious anymore. But, but there are techniques, okay. there are ways. So we can, do, we can do better. So, I mean, you've got energy and resource use, land use and transportation. Yeah, those are the next three biggies. Um, energy use, uh, we need to reduce as much as possible the resources and the energy that we use. Um, the best uh, way of 
providing energy, uh, the, the best energy, is the energy not used. Yes. So conservation, conservation. has to be yeah. goal number one. Uh, because, you know, energy use is responsible for a lot of the GHGs we have. Uh, resource use is responsible for a lot of destruction. And there's always going to be some of it. But let's minimize it. Uh, um, so that's a critical one. And then the energy we do use, uh, let's try to use it from renewables like solar photovoltaic, which uh, 10 years ago was incredibly expensive. It's changing really, really quickly. Texas, interesting of all places, came out with a study this year that said solar energy, solar photovoltaic, getting your electricity from panels, is almost as cheap in Texas as natural gas. Yeah. That's a remarkable change, so we need to go that way. Yeah. Land use. Um, we need to have a compact system of land use. If everybody knows if you sprawl out and you put new subdivisions out in, you know, way in the bush or out in the farmland or whatever it happens to be, uh, they're primarily going to be automobile dependent. You have it, when you have that kind of low density spread all over the place, then you just can't afford to, to serve it by transit unless you want to tax people a huge amount because it, it's not viable. Yeah. You know, uh, you have enough people to maybe fill up the bus in the morning and then the rest of the day you're driving your bus around virtually empty. Um, transportation. We already identified the three priorities. If those are our priorities, what are we going to do to make them happen? Uh, well, how what are, are we, we going to get are, more yeah, people to walk? More so people how, to what are we doing or what can we do? Oh, there's a lot of things. Uh, one, if you do compact land use and then you put services close by so that, hey, it's a two minute walk to the grocery store or a three minute walk to get a cup of coffee and sit and relax with your friends, then you're, you're, you're quite possibly gonna walk. Uh, if it's a half hour or an hour walk, um, the good old, you know, two kilometers for a quart yeah. of milk. Yeah. Um, people aren't gonna do then it. You won't do it. Okay. Cycling, for most people, I cycle. Uh, sometimes people say that they think I have a death wish. You know, uh, well I don't but it's a way that I prefer to get around. If you want people to cycle, you've got to make them in a situation where they feel comfortable and they feel safe. And that means probably separated cycle paths. You know, um, my wife cycles, but she really isn't very comfortable in, in traffic, and I don't blame her. No, uh, it's crazy I, out there. I, I mean, I've been knocked off my bike two or three times. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, nothing too serious, but no. And then transit, you know, uh, transit has to be probably dedicated right away transit during rush hours. Who wants to take the bus if the bus is stu stuck in the same traffic as everybody else? Yeah. And you know what, like, t talking of buses, I've stopped taking the bus. I, I just find them just, first of all, you have to stand there and you're waiting on a busy street with cars rushing by and people on bikes going by you while you're waiting for the bus and you know, they're on, and then the buses are noisy uncomfortable, loud, there's people playing music on it. Yeah. It's like they're trying to make the buses not work. And no, I don't know why. I don't think they're trying, but well, you that's know, what, but I what see you're happening. saying is not incorrect. My daughter has chosen not to have a driver's license and travels by bike a lot, yeah. but also on the bus. And her friends will say, oh, gee, poor old, you know, has to take the loser cruiser. The loser cruiser, right. <laughs> you know? Um, transit would like I'm just to saying it could be a lot better. Oh, absolutely. And transit would better. like to do that. Yeah. But we have to be willing to make the investments. Um, you say cities are for people and should be full of people places. Yeah. Um, you know, I am one who believes that we really need a strong, vibrant downtown core. So I'm a supporter of the downtown Victoria as a critical part of our region. But the days that used to be here, way back when you had to go downtown to buy a refrigerator or a TV are long, long gone and they're not coming back. So you have to do things to make downtowns attractive so that people want to be there. Yeah, and I'll tell you, downtown Victoria to me is not like that. No, they, uh, uh, there's lots of good things in downtown Victoria. But I think for too long we sort of coasted on, oh, you know, gee, we, we're this wonderful place. Uh, you just got to work at it and say, how can we make people want to be here? Plain and simple. 
Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can do. I mean, uh, I was in New York City uh, last year, fortunately before Hurricane Sandy, not much before, <laughs> before. And I mean, there's things like the High Line Park that was an old rail elevator railway that turned into a park. All, you know, just. You know, I wish we would hear more about, yeah. about good things that are happening. Like, that sounds interesting. But yeah. all the good things that various cities are doing to make themselves oh, great. Oh, absolutely. We never even hear about it, yeah. so we don't I, I know mean, what to do. I mean, I was in um, New York two years apart last year and then two years before that. I couldn't believe the changes in cycling. They had taken Broadway, for example, closed down a lane, made cycle paths, you know, separated them with planters. Why or can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Well, why it's, aren't we it's doing? It's called it? political inertia. You know, somebody has to have the courage to get out and say, you know, this is what we need to do. Vancouver's doing it. Yeah. Yes, and boy, is the mayor of Vancouver taking flack in the media. Yeah, I know, from, but you know, uh, to my I mean, mind, they just want that to fail, and you know, yeah, well, yeah, but to my mind, that's why you're elected as a politician to do what needs to be done. And, and you need to try to explain to people, bring them along, but that's why you're there. Well, I think you're there to do what people want done. Well, yes, to some degree, but you know, sometimes you are in a unique position where you have access to a lot more information. That information should be out to everybody, you know? Well, it's... sometimes it is, but people are very busy in their lives yeah. and they don't necessarily take the time to pay attention to it. So that's the reason for Natural City. It's to say, yeah. you know, there's a better way. Yeah, there's a better way. And uh, unfortunately, we're almost on, uh, You just mentioned the Douglas Quarter. I think we've got about a minute left. Yeah, so. well, sometime maybe we can do some more in the Natural City. But uh, I think the number one opportunity we have for really visionary redevelopment is in the Douglas Quarter from the old Hudson Bay building, the Hudson now, right out to Uptown. It's tired. It's underdeveloped. It's not particularly attractive. It is really, really ripe for redevelopment. And it's a perfect location. It's close to everything. You know, it's, it's sitting with Uptown at one end that is going to be more and more a center, you know, along, and the city of Victoria downtown at the other end. Uh, what a perfect place to build a remarkable visionary community where you might have as many as 25 or 30,000 people in a really, really attractive environment where where it's attractive to live and let's hope let's hope we can do it because if it's just left up to the developers I mean uh, they just don't seem to be able to do it well developers can't lead that type of thing yeah. um, developers are essential to us and, yeah, and they have a, a lot role of, to play a lot of really good ones Vic, but I'm afraid we're out of time fair enough thanks for watching you, this Jack. segment of Citizens Forum and thank you Victor <laughs>